very much for joining us today. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce Professor Ben Colvin, who's Professor of Political Philosophy at the University of Glasgow, and also visiting Professor of the Centre for Education and Policy Analysis. And he's going to speak to us about his experience as leading a refugee and assessment at the Glasgow, and looking in particular about criteria for improving our outputs for submission to REF. So if you'd have me Thank you very much, John. Um, is that microphone picking up? Okay, perfect, good. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for coming along. It, it's not exactly a title for a session to set the blood racing, is it? Sort of stuff to do with ref submission. But I, I'm, I'm delighted to see people, people here. As John says, I'm, I'm a professor at the University of Glasgow. Um, I was head of department through the process uh, the Department of Philosophy, that is, uh, through the process of preparing for our submission for the last REF. Um, and also, I've, I've played a role in helping some other HEIs to prepare for REF as well. I was an external um, advisor at London Metropolitan University in the run-up to the last REF, and I'm, I'm performing the same role at the moment for Swansea University. All of which is to say, um, this is really an opportunity for me to sort of share a, a couple of the things that I've gleaned from that experience, which in some senses won't necessarily uh, automatically translate to, to the experience of sort of colleagues in this room, not all of whom will be philosophers. Some are philosophers, John's a philosopher, but not everybody is a philosopher, I think. Um, but also sort of learning a little bit about what can be sort of helpful to think about in, sort of prepar in, in advance of making, uh, uh, sort of putting your research plans together. So here's what I plan to do. I'm going to just say something briefly about the basic shape of REF and why it matters. Um, some of that will be familiar to, me, to people, but for other people it might not be, and it's useful to frame the discussion. I'll also briefly talk about what a REF submission is and how individual research outputs fit into that, because I think it frames our expectations of what we as individuals are expected to do, in particular because it's changed recently. And then the bulk of what I'm going to do is to talk about the three and four star criteria for outputs, what they mean, how they've been applied and interpreted in the past, and what that might mean if now you're thinking about your own research projects, your own research decisions, and how that could feed into what you do next. Um, because I think it's much easier to make fitting into REF consistent with what you, as an autonomous researcher, want to do if you're aware of the criteria to begin with, rather than trying to retrofit it later. OK, so that's the plan. First thing is just briefly to talk about um, REF itself. Here's a quick caveat. Um, the, we, we had a REF exercise that sort of finished a few years back. We don't yet know the details of the rules for REF 2028. And I'm not going to talk as though we do know the details of the rules. That would be sort of unnecessary speculation. And also, of course, the rules will differ from um, uh, unit of assessment to unit of assessment between panels and sub-panels and so on. So we don't know what the exact rules are and they're likely to vary from place to place. But nevertheless, I think this, this will be useful. It's useful to get ahead of the game. And I think that um, the broad shape of the REF exercise is likely to be similar to what it's been in the past, even if sort of some of the details differ. So here's the thought. It's a seven-year, roughly seven-year um, uh, assessment exercise, which determines, at least in part, where the government's generic research funding goes to. Just as a quick primer, there are roughly four sources of funding for universities on 2021 20, to 22 Hef, um, HESA figures. That's roughly 54% tuition fees across the sector, 15% res specific research grants and contracts. 18% um, is kind of miscellaneous other income, commercial stuff, endowments, and so on. About 13% of uh, universities' funding across the board comes from direct funding body grants. And of that, that's divided into direct money from government to pay for teaching, about 4% of the total um, in England and Wales, unlike in my home jurisdiction of Scotland. That's basically a direct grant to cover some expensive STEM subjects. Um, and a direct grant to pay for uh, research, and that's about 7% of the total. So REF feeds into the distribution only of that last 7%. It's proportionally not very big, 
although in absolute terms it amounts to a somewhat over um, sort of three billion pounds across the UK, I think, last, last year was determined this way. But it's important for universities because unlike other forms of funding, it's not tied to teaching and it's not tied to specific external research funds. It's the stuff that funds the blue skies thinking that we can do as part of our research. So I think universities care about this a lot. It's allocated on the basis of a formula just based on the amount of high quality research being produced. Now the current formula, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, Professor. Um, the current formula takes into account only three star and four star research um, and allocates, I think, four times as much to the latter as to the former. Is that right? So there's a strong incentive for institutions that um, we uh, submit as much four-star research as possible because it gives us more of this generic research funding which doesn't tie us to pr particular promised research, uh, projects or outputs but which we can use to fund the kind of what we might think of as the core research that we do. Okay, so that's what REF does. Um, here's something about, an in, about how the individual submissions work. So unlike in previous exercises, in 2021, all staff with significant responsibility for research were returned. Uh, what significant responsibility meant is determined by people's contractual status. So academic staff with a contract of employment of 0.2 full-time equivalent or greater that are on the payroll of the submitting institution on the census date, whose primary employment function is to undertake either research only or teaching and research. That's a quotation directly from the guidance for submissions. Now that matters because in previous times, if there was anybody who was involved in, uh, employed in sort of around the time of REF 2014, there was much anguish on the part of institutions about which individuals should be or should not be submitted. Had an effect on people's contract status and so on. In, in 2021, it wasn't like that. Anybody who was on a reasonably substantial contract who had research as part of their job description was supposed to be part of the submission. Unclear whether this will be maintain, maintained next time round, but on the whole, I think that it was a well-received component of REF 21. I think people felt that it was fairer than the previous way of doing things, so I suspect it'll be the same. What is a submission? Well, the biggest component of a REF submission is outputs, um, so research, in, uh, individual pieces of research. That counted for 60% of a submission in 21. Um, the other components are impact case studies. Those were uh, worth 25% of people's score in the last ref. And a statement of your research environment, which talked about uh, your research culture, talked about grant capture, talked about support for research students, that type of thing. That was worth 15%. So outputs, although the relative uh, significance of the individual pieces of research that we produce has dwindled over the years, nevertheless, it's still the single biggest component of uh, what we do in a REF submission. Here are some brief things to bear in mind about that, which impact on your decisions about what you write. The first thing is that now the submission of outputs is collective rather than individual. So in 2014 and before, each individual member of staff submitted put forward four outputs, where that total could also be reduced if people were early career or had special circumstances but there was an expectation that each person was returned individually. This time, by contrast, uh, units of assessment uh, collectively put forward uh, two and a half times the submitted um, headcount rounded to the nearest whole number. There was some scope for reducing that in, if there were individual members of staff with special circumstances, but on the whole, they were more stringent about it than they had been previously. So two and a half times the total number of people in your unit of assessment. Now, the rule was that there had to be at least one output from everybody, so nobody would be submitted with no outputs, and there could be at most five outputs from any one individual. But within that, there was flexibility. And so what we found was that units of assessment would perhaps have some people who would have three, four, maybe five pieces of work submitted, some people who would have only one piece of work submitted. There was therefore more flexibility because the submission was collective. That's important because it means that I think, firstly, the total amount that one's expected to produce is less. And secondly, that it opens up the scope for there to be some of the research that we do which isn't necessarily aimed at the criteria I'm going to talk through today because um, so an average of two and a half outputs per person is actually less punishing than the previous regime. Third point, this is speculation, but I'll share it with you now because it's useful to know. It seems possible, indeed likely, that next time round outputs will not be portable. 
What does that mean? Well, in 2014 and before, your publications traveled with you. So for example, I published an, an amount of stuff employed at Glasgow. If I took up a full-time position here at Liverpool Hope, for the purposes of REF, I'd stick those outputs into my satchel, bring them here, and they would count as part of Liverpool Hope's submission. In 2021, publications from people who moved could, with certain restrictions, be counted in both places, because what the idea was was that we were transitioning to a situation where uh, outputs would not be portable. That is, the stated intention going forward, but we don't know whether this will happen. This was quite controversial. The stated, con the stated intention going forwards was that publications will stay with the institution that employed you at the time that they were published. Um, I think it's worth our while generally keeping an eye on this because it has a big effect on the incentives when it comes to thinking about what jobs we do and where and if we want to move institutions, for example. Third point is that outputs um, will need to be open access. Exactly what, rules, um, they, exactly what rules and what will count as open access hasn't quite been settled, yet it seems likely that it'll be aligned with the Research Council's rules about open access, but I think it's just important to keep an eye on what the rules there are. In general, I suspect what it'll mean is that um, research has to be deposited in an open access repository, perhaps an institutional repository. Maybe for some disciplines that will incorporate an embargo period where it's okay for things to be restricted for a few months before being fully open access access. In other disciplines that might not be the case and it may be that REF takes a hard line on this and reduces the embargo completely. Just keep your eyes open for that because it's possible inadvertently to end up publishing in places where it's not possible to submit that stuff for REF now because that stuff is inconsistent with open access publishing. Uh, finally, just a point about special considerations. Some outputs can be given special treatment. Um, so, for example, you can request that some outputs be double-weighted if you think that they are substantial enough, the, the contribution they make is substantial enough, that they should be counted for two outputs in the, general, um, the, so in the general submission. Generally speaking, that's the case with monographs. Most of the uh, double-weighted double outputs that um, uh, are submitted, at least in a discipline like mine, will be people's substantial research monographs rather than papers. Um, also, people last time around had the opportunity to flag up work that was interdisciplinary. That is to say, which doesn't entirely fit within any of the units of assessment by themselves. Um, those were then given special consideration, um, either with the, sub the home sub-panel being given advisors from somewhere else, or in some cases with a given uh, sort of output being sent between different sub-panels to make sure that it gets a fair hearing. I expect that there will be some rules of that sort next time around as well. Okay. So that's the general context. I realize that's a little bit of a whistle-stop tour, but don't worry, there is a handout which um, John will be able to circulate for people after this session, which just summarizes that briefly as well. I think what I wanted to do really was just to give a sense of the context here, but also to show why there's an institutional reason and perhaps also an individual reason to try to maximize the number of four-star outputs that we produce. So suppose that you want to do that. Do you accept that reason? How might we go about doing it? Well, I think a lot has to do with planning our research activity in advance. Choices about what to focus on, which research projects to pursue, which ones not to pursue, but also choices about how to frame those projects when we publish them, how we write them. Um, so to start with, let me just sort of state the, um, the REF criteria for 2021. Uh, Four-star research uh, was described uh, in general as quality that is world-leading in terms of originality, significance, and rigor. Three-star research was described as quality that is internationally excellent in terms of originality, significant, significance, and rigor, but which falls short of the highest standards of excellence. So generic as to be almost useless, I think. It doesn't give you very much guidance. But individual panels, and sometimes individual sub-panels, tend to publish statements over time setting out what features they understand as instantiating these general requirements in their particular areas. So your research will be submitted to a particular sub-panel, which will normally sort of, sort of correspond to your discipline. Uh, they will be part of one of the, the, the four general panels. So in general, I think, and I say this um, not to undercut what I'm about to do with you, but nevertheless, it seems important. In general, there's no substitute for looking at everything of that sort, all of the guidance of that sort that your particular panel or sub-panel produces as we get closer to REF. Last time round, uh, my specific panel was panel D. 
Um, that includes uh, philosophy, but various other sort of humanities subjects, theology as well, for example. Um, I suspect that there might be quite a lot of people in the room if we have lots of social scientists here, for example, whose uh, panel would have been C last time round. That covers quite a lot of social science subjects. Um, education, for example, is, is panel C. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about the guidance that was given by panel F D about how to interpret those four and three star criteria. But the guidance from panel uh, the guidance from panel C was pretty similar, and I think there are also lessons to be drawn for the other panels as well, albeit that the process of researching in the sciences, for example, is rather different to the process of research for someone like me. So here's how panel D glossed those four-star criteria. Um, I quote, in assessing work as being four-star, quality that is world-leading in terms of originality, significance, and rigor, sub-panels will expect to see evidence of, or potential for, some of the following kinds of characteristics across and possibly beyond the area or field. First, they look for uh, a primary or essential point of reference, something that is of profound influence, something that is instrumental in developing new thinking, practices, paradigms, policies, or audiences, or something that is a major expansion in the range and the depth of research and its applications, something that is outstandingly novel, innovative, and or creative. These aren't all necessary conditions. You don't have to have a single um, piece of research that hits all of those descriptors in order to count as four star, but they are kind of indicative about the type of thing that the panel was looking for. Contrast that with what they said about three star research where they looked for the following characteristics which contrast slightly. Something which is an important point of reference, something which is of lasting influence, not profound, lasting. A catalyst for or important contrib contribution to new thinking, practices, paradigms, policies, audiences. A significant expansion of the range and the depth of research and its application. Something which is significantly novel or innovative or creative. So the four-star descriptors are on the whole just more laudatory. It's a primary or essential point of reference if it's four-star. It's, if it's important, it's three-star. If the influence is profound, it's four-star. If the influence is just lasting, it's three-star. Um, four-star research is instrumental in creating new ways of thinking. Three-star research is a catalyst for or an important contribution to doing so. So, a couple of crucial things to note. The first thing is that these descriptors refer to what the work merits, not what actual effect or reception it had. In these two panels, at least, certainly in the humanities, citation data, journal location, press, and so on, those things don't feed into the assessment of the outputs. What the panel was doing was evaluating whether the outputs deserved that kind of reception. And even if they didn't receive that type of thing, for example, if they weren't published in the best places, they could nevertheless get the highest um, evaluation if the panel thought they merited it. For that panel, I think that in other panels there's been a push, in fact across the board there's been a push for more metrics in the evaluation of the outputs, um, so check what's going on in your particular panels. Even in the humanities I think there's a push for more of a metric way of doing it. But at least last time around um, what they evaluated was what outputs deserved, not what outputs actually got. Second, uh, world leading and international and national, those phrases, those things are quality benchmarks. They're not stipulations about content. So somebody doesn't automatically get a leg up towards four star research by talking about more than one country or writing in a language other than English, for example. Something that is internationally significant might be um, something which engages only with research from one country and nevertheless still be of international significance. Now, these sort of descriptors that I read out to you, they're really ways of understanding what originality and significance amount to. Um, my sub-panel, and I think panel D in general, consistently said that superb rigor is a threshold. Remember the three components of a ref evaluation, rigor, significance, originality. So without superb rigor, the argument was you can't get above two star for a piece of research, no matter how much merit it has in other respects. But above that threshold, rigor plays little role in settling whether an output gets two star, three star, or four star. Originality and significance are the things that determine that. I think that's similar to the, the approach that was taken by other panels too. 
So how does one go about hitting that benchmark in terms of originality and significance? There's a little bit of a tendency here, I think, to fall back on aphorisms. That's because it's remarkably hard to give an algorithm for determining an output's score and therefore for designing how you produce an output in advance. There does seem to be a remarkable degree of calibration between reviewers on what something gets. So I don't think the reviewing process is arbitrary in the sense that it's just pure luck what our outputs get when they're evaluated. But of course, that fact sits a little uncomfortably with the difficulty that even experienced ref reviewers have in being totally specific about the reasons that underpin that um, convergence there. Still, with apologies for a few aphorisms, here are some thoughts that I've had or have been shared with me about this. So one way of capturing it is to say that four-star work is either the first or the last word on a subject, something which initiates a whole new debate, for example, by defending a strikingly new proposal or by demonstrating a serious and previously under-examined problem. That type of thing could get four-star for that reason. Alternatively, something which persuasively and definitively settles a debate by synthesizing a novel and powerful theory or produces decisive data of some sort, that will do the same. So that looking, aiming for something that's either the first word or the last word in a debate is getting you into kind of four-star territory. The contrast here is with something which primarily reports other original work or makes a merely incremental contribution within an existing debate in the relevant scholarly literature. Those types of things can be important and valuable scholarly outputs. As I said earlier on, the aim of the REF criteria is not to prevent people from writing things of that sort. But it's unlikely that an output with that kind of incremental character is going to be four-star research. Indeed, may not be three-star research either, depending upon how constrained the ambition of the contribution is. Here's another way of capturing it. People sometimes talk about four-star research as being the research that initiates a sea change in a certain field. Now, that raises a kind of philosophical question about how we individuate fields. Um, I work on ways of thinking about individual autonomy. Initiating a sea change in the study of self-authorship views of autonomy is one thing, kind of comparatively easy. I've done it, but that's because there are only about three of us who do that type of thing in the world. Initiating a sea change in political philosophy as a whole is quite another thing. So how do you, uh, so the talk about initiating a sea change in a field, of course, raises this question of how, how big the field has to be, how we individuate them. I guess my view is that we, as subject specialists in different areas, have a sense, though, of what the relevant distinctions are. I think they'll normally sit between the two extremes that I just listed. So maybe this idea of creating a sea change in a field is something that's useful as a guide to what we aim to write, even if it's difficult to come up with nice, sharp, explicit criteria. I suspect that we've all had the experience of reading research, which we feel has made a sea change to the fields that we work in. Um, relatedly, I think that we can use our experience as readers of research, especially as peer reviewers of other people's research, to good effect here. So, just look at the criteria, um, or think about those criteria for REF that I, I mentioned. So we can ask of our own work things like, look, is this a piece which would be really useful and interesting for somebody to make use of if they were writing within the field? If so, then it looks like it's at least three star. Is it further something which we would think them negligent for not referring to? If that's the case, then it seems likely that it's something that's going to be four-star. And I guess that we can all think with our own subjects about sources or interventions or pieces of research which have the latter characteristic, that if you read a submission to a journal, for example, and it doesn't reference this particular thing, that that means that the submission is poor for that reason. That's a good way of getting a handle on what it means for something to be four-star in terms of being a primary point of reference in a subject. So, as I said, if it's the former, if it's just interesting and useful, then it looks like it's an important point of reference, which is to say three star. If the latter, then it's a primary or essential point of reference, which makes it four star. And ditto for the other criteria. That is, you can go through those three and four star criteria, and as I said, don't worry, they're going to be on the handout, so you can look at them in detail there. And for each of them, you can think, well, look, how does this map onto my experience of evaluating, as a peer reviewer, other people's work? And you'll be able, it's useful to get a sense of how those criteria can be operationalized through that. Okay, to conclude, all of that suggests a couple of rules of thumb. One of them is that for publications we hope might be four-star, it's good to avoid writing things that are just responses to some other piece of research, or which just systematize or report on the scholarly state of play 
in a bit of our discipline. Those types of things can be genuinely excellent, and they can be things which are very worthwhile to do for our reputation as individual researchers, for the benefit of our disciplines as well. But those types of outputs won't be the sorts of things that get you the top rating, just because of the type of thing that they are. So, if you want to write a four-star piece of research, don't write something like that. It's the first rule of thumb. Second, I think that at least part of this point about the originality and significance of research is not just about the content and the design of the research research project. It's also about how we frame those things. So one practical thing that I think is, is really handy is just using introductions and conclusions of the pieces of research we write to emphasize those four starish qualities of the piece. That's partly because the question of what type of significance something has is determined by those framing effects. But it also means that it's a kind of hack that exploits facts about the way that the REF process works. Um, REF re reviewers really don't have all that long to evaluate each individual output. In my subject, philosophy, we worked out that there was an average of 20 minutes for each reviewer for each output. So the amount of time that they can spend on individual outputs is considerably less, for example, than a journal reviewer will. It's really very, very fast indeed. That means that putting those things which signal four-star status front and center in the way that you describe the research right at the outset is really important. It can nudge things in one direction rather than another. And in some cases, there will be a genuine choice about how you frame things. Um, I made a terrible choice with one of my pieces of research uh, about the idea of authenticity, where it was sort of quite, well, I think it had quite sort of striking, profound, important implications. I guess everybody thinks that about what they do. Um, but I chose, to, I think it could have been four star in other words, but for reasons that I now regret, I chose to frame that research just as a kind of development of somebody else's view. That is, I sort of, I was unnecessarily deferent to an existing view in the literature and presented this actually quite original thing that I was developing as though it was just an amendment of that existing view. So it pulled it down to three star, correctly, because of the way that it was presented. But notice that I had a choice about how I did that. I made a choice to present it as incremental rather than as something different. If you're thinking about how to make your research four star, then don't make my choices, basically. Finally, I think, and this is something that's good about REF, I think it, it rewards people being ambitious. I think one good consequence of the changes in rules between 2014 and now is that it disincentivizes the production of large quantities of scholastic, merely incremental research work. I think that it certainly seems to me that philosophy, my discipline, has been really plagued by that recently. There's an enormous amount of research to read each element of which is really quite small, doesn't do very much. I like the fact myself that the ref rules now disincentivize people to do that kind of work. I like the fact that the four star criteria encourage us to focus on writing fewer things, but more striking contributions to our various fields. So in that sense, although this is a kind of constraint, I hope it's an exciting opportunity as well. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, I lost track of time a little bit, but I think, is there a bit of time for questions, John, if people have it? People want to stay. We've, we've uh, used 13 minutes, and so if people need to leave, they should. But if you want to stay, please, please do. So, gotcha. leaving, might take a moment to formulate any questions. Yeah. Sorry, very uh, sorry for overrunning slightly, folks, about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So it's not quite clear in some but when we put it on like the high rank, is it that you can think is that is that our institution? Yeah. So does that then is that making it open access? Yes, that is open access. Yeah. So of course the appropriate embargo will be applied if there is one from the publisher's side. So, so at the moment we're in this slightly sort of ambiguous situation where funding bodies and governments are trying to push us in the direction of having publicly funded research, purely open access right from the start. The moment you publish it, somebody can download it and read it for free. Publishers have a sort of funding model, basically, whereby that's kind of death to the way that they, they, they do things if they're not canny about it. So um, one of the ways that the circle has been squared is this notion of an embargo uh, whereby often what will happen is that you'll publish, for example, an article in a journal, 
the journal will say, yeah, okay, you can, you can put this into your institution's open access repository, but we ask you not to make it publicly available for six months, 12 months, 24 months. Um, so one of the things that will be thrashed out in the run-up to the next ref is whether um, the ref rules will permit any embargo at all, and if so, how long that embargo will be, and that might well differ for different disciplines. Um, I think the, the humanities especially try, uh, journals in the humanities especially resisted getting rid of embargoes completely. Um, to some extent, it's just a question of um, waiting to see exactly how the rules work out. It doesn't just apply to REF, by the way. It also applies to lots of externally funded research as well. Lots of the external funders are falling in with this project as well. For our purposes, I think it means two things. One of them is that it's a pretty bad idea if there's, an, if there's a piece of research you're doing which you think is going to be important for the REF submission next time round. Don't publish it in a journal which definitely doesn't allow open access. Some of them don't. And there's just no point for stuff that you want to go into REF in publishing in that type of place, because it can't count. And the second thing is to be aware that um, at a more fine-grained level, you might want to look at the length of embargo before something can be published that different journals or venues or monograph publishers allow. Um, because I think uh, at some point, each of us are going to have to start um, lining those individual journal policies up against the, um, the, the requirements for, for REF as well. My hunch is that maybe in 10 years, all of this will be completely settled and regularized, and everything will just be completely open access from day one. But we're in a kind of weird transitional period where it would be easy to accidentally get trapped into publishing something in a place that turns out to be ineligible unless one's aware of um, what they say specifically and what the rules are as they evolve. But yeah, if you've got an institutional repository, then in general, that will be the way that we do it. As long as something can get into the institutional repository in the right kind of way, then it will be refable. Hello. Then I have two questions. One is related to Sally's question that there are some journals that, you know, like Greece could purchase where they would allow open access yeah. for staff within that institution to actually publish the article there and then yeah. it comes open access. Does that then sort of suggest that there are some institutions who obviously have more money and therefore they can actually buy such um, you know, privileges that people who are from universities which do not have that kind of funding will be sort of um, set back in the competition, so to say, in this trip? That is the first question. Um, and the second question okay. uh, is, do you, are you then suggesting systematic reviews by virtue of what you just explained? Uh, are three-star rather than four-star, and therefore we should sort of uh, move away from them? Good questions. I'll answer the first one to begin with. Um, I am concerned that the way things are going has that unjust implication, yes. It's not actually an implication of the ref rules themselves. It's an implication of the way that some publishers are trying to sustain their business model in the face of the shift to open access. So the way that publishers are often doing it, this is true of places like OUP, CUP, um, some others that I can think of, is they're moving towards what they call read and publish deals, whereby there's a kind of budget that um, institutions buy in, so that instead of just paying your money to subscribe to a journal, what you do is you pay a bit of money to subscribe to content that you can access that way, but you also buy a number of slots for, for open access publication as well. Now, that's a problem for a number of reasons. One of them is that um, it depends upon your library budget. Different institutions have different library budgets. That's a shame, that's a bad thing. Um, another problem with it is that, uh, in general, those deals come with um, a limited amount of money that's pre-allocated for open access publishing. And it means that an individual researcher's um, chance of being able to access that to have their research go open access will depend upon their individual institution's way of allocating those funds. So one of the things that we've worried about in Glasgow, I, I don't know about the context here in, in, in Liverpool Hope, uh, one of the things we've worried about is that uh, it seems likely that um, comparatively non-lucrative arts and humanities research will be at the back of the queue when it comes to accessing that funding by comparison with work in medical and uh, medical sciences and engineering and, and so on. Uh, so yeah, there are problems there. I think that in some ways the shift towards open access is a brilliant thing for the democratization of knowledge and for giving people access to it. But the way that it's being, this transitional period is tough 
and the way that some publishers are trying to impose a kind of model on us that penalizes people on the basis of how much money their institutions have is also tough. I think we just have to watch out for that and, and try to look for ways that research can be published open access in reputable venues that doesn't depend on that. In mathematics, for example, I think there's now much more research that's published sort of open access right from the start in archive, for instance, um, where that's a model now that just does, it's cut out much of the, the middleman when it comes to publishing. So yeah, it's, it's problematic to acknowledge that. Second thing you asked about systematic reviews, I think that um, I hesitate to give hard and fast rules, but I think that I have never seen a systematic review that struck me as managing to be both brilliant as a systematic review and also hit these four star criteria. I think it might vary a little bit from discipline to discipline, and in disciplines where a systematic review or meta review, uh, sort of meta analyses of existing literature are much more the norm, I imagine it might be possible for somebody to write one of those things that does have the kind of profound impact, how, is itself a primary point of, an essential point of reference within the literature, those sorts of things. But for what it's worth, it's more difficult. There are forms of publishing, forms of research which are tremendously valuable, which I worry are disincentivized by REF. So, for example, book reviews. Book reviews are dying in the humanities. Why? Because they take a lot of time to do um, conscientiously. They're incredibly valuable to us, but no book review is ever going to get more than two star because, because of the kind of thing that it is, that it is just a critical commentary, very narrowly focused on one other output. And that's really sad, because those things are valuable for us to produce. But yeah, it's, it's a problem. Thank you. Obviously, we have choices on where we send our outputs and, and what journals we try to get published in. And I think sometimes it's a choice between a more highly ranked journal that's kind of general, especially in business school, and, and more niche journals that hit a better audience but might not be as highly ranked. Yeah. So I was just wondering what you think as far as how much the journal matters in, in output reviews, if things like journal rankings matter at all, or if it's completely ignored. Gotcha. This is very discipline sensitive very discipline specific. Um, so I think that in place, as I said, different panels kind of operationalize the way the evaluation of originality and significance in different ways. And in some cases it's metric. So they'll be looking at the citation um, factor for a given journal and that will feed into the evaluation of the research that you produce. Um, to get a good sense of that, I think it's worth looking at the guidance that was given by your individual panels last time round, because that'll give you, a, it, it isn't going to be definitive, the rules might change, but it will give you a sense of whether that's the approach that they've taken. If they did take that approach, then absolutely you should be uh, taking account of that when publishing and aim to publish in places that have, for example, high impact factors. For what it's worth, in uh, panel D, my panel, they explicitly said right from the start that they were not working in that kind of way and they were not taking into account location. And actually, I mean, we sort of, we all said, yeah, yeah, sure. But obviously, an article that's published in Mind, which is one of the top philosophy journals, is going to, it, obviously, that's going to be better rated than something that appears in, I don't know, the, sort of the, the, the Croatian Journal of Philosophy, which is a respectable place, but not, not fantastic. Um, but actually, I think looking at, the, looking at the results and looking at the guidance that was given and the reports that were made by the panel afterwards, I think we take them at face value about that. I think they genuinely did try to evaluate um, research on its own merits, no matter what the venue was. Some things that were published in great places, there's, you, I mean, you don't get sort of individualized data about what each output got, but you can kind of infer some things at least. Some stuff that was published in really glitzy places did not get very well reviewed. Other, place, other stuff that appeared in quite um, sort of mediocre venues, or indeed stuff that was published in other ways, just sort of self-published on institutional repositories, did really well. Of course, there may be other reasons for you to want to publish in the best venues. It's good reputationally. You get the kind of feedback that will help you to push your research to be better. Um, it will reach a bro broader audience if it's in the top venues for your disciplines. All of those reasons still apply. But the specific question of whether for REF it manages to publish in the top place um, depends upon your guidance, the individual panel's view. And at least in some places, that doesn't matter at all. I'll take this question and then your question, if that's okay. Just focus, 
are there that they, they, they supposedly don't take any account of where research is what the ideological or whatever, you know, is in place. And I'm not sure what amount of time to look at that level of particularly from younger scholars. So if it's a more experienced scholar who maybe is more likely to get their work published, you might look at in, in more detail about well, how how one is that research when you just the name, which wouldn't be the case for yeah. We, I mean, these things are, there's no substitute to getting subject-specific advice, especially from past REF panelists about this. But I think just for what it's worth, I, I was really astonished and incredulous by the thought that the venue of the publication, um, they said, just didn't matter at all in, in sort of humanities subjects. I also thought there was something slightly improper about that in light of the fact that, as I said, they only had 20 minutes to assess each output. I mean, if, if something's gone through the rigorous um, uh, peer review process that gets you published in a place like Mind, for example, which has about 1,000 submissions per year and publishes maybe 30 articles, um, then you might think that it, it, actually the ref process should piggyback on that and should take venue more seriously. But as a matter of fact, I think I, I, there's, there's reason to think that they certainly don't do it systematically, although there are going to be kind of complicated effects in some cases of the sort that you described. Yeah, I mean, of course, REF is, is an expert review. They say it's an expert review. And they do say that when you publish the venue or the outlet is not, it's, it's not important. But of course, if you publish in top outlets, you can't go wrong. That is the idea. Because you have already gone through a very rigorous process of peer review. The thing about citation data or rankings is you could accumulate citations for all wrong reasons. We know there are examples in particular. Yeah. So uh, citation indices are not all that important. So the top match journals they have tiny, tiny impact factor. So I think we should really be focusing on top outlets where you know, you get noticed. I think that, that, that's an important thing. You know, where it's hard to get in, but it requires real kind of, a, you know, yeah. long hours of work of the research. That's right. Send it out and stuff. And you get some very, very kind of rigorous feedback, which is also very valuable. Yeah. No, that's, that's precisely correct. I think there are multiple incentives for trying to publish in the top places. All of these seem exactly correct, including the thought that having gone through that process and getting into very good places is good evidence for you that this is the sort of thing that will hit those highest criteria for REF. But the point about there not being a direct correlation between the number of citations you get and meeting these criteria, that's really important. The criteria are about what the work merits, not about what it actually gets. There can be work which really merits a significant impact and citation, which because of the vagaries of academic life, you just did, you don't get it. Like so David Hume's great book sort of fell stillborn from the press. Nobody read it for decades. Still, it merited it and would have been evaluated as meriting it to start with. On the other hand, you might get things which actually get loads of citations but are intellectually really slight because they're just sort of controversial muck raking or something of that sort. Um, so I think, yeah, that seems correct. Uh, can I just ask a question? Of course. Many schools of education we try to encourage, but yeah. given the criteria that you've outlined in terms of hitting that four star, you know, having the last and first word on the debate, you know, it's unlikely that smaller scale practitioner research will be hitting those that, that criteria. Um, and I suppose it's just that I'm just highlighting the tension we have in education at the moment, um, and it's trying to understand well how to navigate that. I suppose one way for us to approach it is to maybe speak to some of the panel members from 2021 what practitioner research was deemed to be successful. Yeah. And it's very difficult, like you say, to look at submissions and reports on submissions and work out what was successful and what wasn't successful research. You don't see that the granular sort of information. Do you so have any suggestions on that? Um. On working out how to evaluate particular submissions, I mean, you've said everything that I would say. I think it's hard and there's no substitute for specific advice because they don't make public the grade that each thing got. 
Um, but I'll, speak, I'll say something to your point about certain types of valuable research being disincentivized by this, because it picks up some of the points that we were talking about earlier when we discussed systematic reviews. That is a genuine worry. Now, the official line, I guess, would be to say this, look, the overall amount of research that you have to publish to submit to REF is now less than it used to be. The average is two and a half outputs per person, and it's a seven-year window. So in principle, what that says is, I mean, I think you, know, um, you shouldn't be aspiring to produce only two and a half pieces of research in seven years. There's lots of space for you to produce not only the stuff that's your contribution collectively to your unit of assessment, but also other kinds of valuable research that matter to you, matter to your discipline. REF is just capturing a snapshot of part of it. So that's, one of, that's part of the answer. The other is that the shift to the collective um, submission rather than the individual submission changes the ecosystem for submitting research. It allows a group of scholars, for example, in the School of Education, to come together and to think, right, well, look, I mean, there are lots of different kinds of valuable research that we want to do. Some of them will sort of be really good for REF, and some of them will not be really good for REF. Collectively, we just need to ensure that amongst all of us, we're able to produce enough of the stuff that hits the REF criteria and is the right kind of research that we can get our submission in. And that might mean, for example, collectively deciding, well, look, Professor X or Dr. Y or uh, whoever it is tends to produce the kind of research that hits those descriptors. So we anticipate that the submission is going to be largely, is going to be weighted towards that person's research. That opens up space in principle for other people to produce, pursue different kinds of research projects, which in the grand scheme of things are equally valuable. They're not just as, they're just not sort of as ref visible. Now, of course, that's the official story. The problem with that is when you have the incentives for individual members of staff within institutions being heavily tied to whether you as an individual are making a big contribution to the REF submission. Again, I don't know how things are here, but in Glasgow, um, a big problem is that we talk that talk, and yet uh, promotion to uh, sort of senior lecturer, reader, professor, depends upon you having individual contributions of research you make that can meet REF criteria at various levels. And that seems unjust. It seems like there's a tension there between the uh, holistic idea that we can create a context where there's still space for the type of research you allude to, and the operationalization of it in a particular institution, which might mean that somebody nevertheless is doing themselves some harm by pursuing it. Um, I think, I guess, as individual researchers, we just have to watch out for what the rules are where we are and make sure that we don't inadvertently damage ourselves in that way. And if we do have rules which are such that you would damage yourself by producing work that is of scholarly value in a way that would not harm the overall uh, sort of ref submission, then that's a reason to advocate for change for those rules. But it's, you're right, it's a problem to look out for. Yeah. I think um, it's difficult to say these things candidly with a pro vice chancellor in the room in some ways. Um, in the way that we did it in Glasgow was that we had serious worries about that, and they wrote a specific. Um, they wrote criteria by which you could demonstrate that you satisfied uh, professor, uh, the, the descriptors for being a professor, focusing on impact rather than research. Indeed, in fact, for what it's worth, that's, that's how I got my professorship. I, I deliberately made a decision about seven years ago that although I was continuing to produce my scholarly research, the most important things that I, would do, I was doing were to do with a couple of impact case studies that I led. And thankfully, the criteria in Glasgow um, meant that it was possible for me to basically submit that as my evidence of scholarly activity in place of more traditional research outputs. Um, not everywhere is doing that. I think this is a process, this is a period of change for sort of universities where there are kind of it's difficult to balance various different considerations here. We haven't really talked about impact today because I, I, I overran by 50% even without talking about impact. Um, so, but, but I think you're right that sort of how you think about how you as an individual researcher interact with the impact case studies is maybe a, a topic for another time. It's important. 
There was a question over here before I come to you, if that's okay, John. And then I'm very aware of not wanting the timetable to slip for the rest of the morning. So perhaps we'll, we'll bring it to a close after John's question, if that's okay. But you go first. My question has been covered by Bob Curtin and Phil asked about the power test and how it impacts the writing. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm Yeah, I think that's I think that's right, but I think the headline news is that prestige turns out to be less important than you might have thought. So, but thank you. I'm I'm glad we managed to cover it. John? What sorts of good strategies for working towards four-star papers can an institution adopt? <laughs> I take it that's a kind of, I guess you could at an individual level, what should one do, but I guess it's better considered what should a department do. Um, it's a good question. I think um, four-star research is the type of thing that doesn't target low-hanging fruit, is one thing to say. So I think that you need to have a research culture which encourages people and supports people in investing in quite long-term substantial projects that might not have an immediate payoff, that might not issue in a publication immediately where um, the kind of the narrow, the, sort of the, the, the narrow uh, sort of justification for it um, in terms of, for example, responding to a, a recent article or fitting into some kind of current agenda um, that you're not required to justify things in those terms. So I think that researcher autonomy is a big part of it. I think that individual researchers are in the best position, really, to work out where the big questions in their part of their discipline is, such that aiming at those is the sort of thing that could have profound impact, could produce something which is an essential, enduring point of reference. So that's one thing. I think that you need to, an institution, whether it's a university as a whole or a department, needs to have the courage to say to people, OK, you're telling me that what you're going to do is go and spend the next two years working on this, and we're going to see nothing between now and then that will allow us to evaluate whether that's going well, that will allow us to tick boxes about whether you're hitting the re re relevant metrics. Um, it's, it's kind of a, it, it's a big investment, and it means that it's a kind of risky thing for um, institutions who might want to be able to monitor stuff um, for various reasons, some supportive, some not in the shorter term. Um, that's one part of it. I think the other part of it, John, is that um, it has a lot to do with what types of things you choose to do. And I think that we as individual researchers have a sort of sense of the things that we, want, we might want to do which are difficult and the things which are easy. And there are certain things, I think, which are kind of easy. And if you're looking for a quick publication, it's the sort of thing you're minded to do. You read a really annoying article in a journal that says something you think is clearly wrong. And you think, oh, great, I can kind of rush off a quick article. It'll respond to that. It'll say why it's wrong. And that means that I get another line on my CV. I think gumming up your writing process with that type of thing is uh, a bad individual strategy for getting four-star stuff. Of badish mantra that leads you into that temptation yeah. to respond to everything and submit. You know, just respond and submit some, uh, an article which is half cooked. It's not a full research methodology. So just to get something out because it looks nice on the CV with long detail of publications. Just so. I, my rule of thumb would be that publish and flourish actually rather than perish. Uh, with that, I think. Three very high quality articles over five years is probably a better strategy. Yeah, agreed. You know, and I have to say, I mean, and said recently, said on the promotions panel, it's the quality which is more important rather than the you know, quantity. Yeah. I think this is down to institutional culture as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so, fortunately, in this institution, at least, we don't follow this, which is good. We have colleagues from other universities, and this is what they do. You know, they yeah. just keep on, you know, paying hundred dollars to these Chinese journals, and and they think that it's just a publication. So yeah. And the the universities seem to encourage this, which is surprising. Yeah. So over here, we don't have this, which is which is good. I think it's good. I think it's good to have a culture which.
prioritizes quality rather than quantity. And it's also nice that we now have REF criteria which reward that as well. But I think that the, the I'd, I'd like, before it feels too irenic in the room, I'd like to sort of reiterate the first point as well, which is that it takes courage on the part of managers and institutions and individual researchers to go for the tight kinds of things that might fail and that might not show results for quite a long time. And I think it's really helpful for us to think that actually having a culture which supports people to take those risks and chances and allows the time for that research to flourish and develop and then produce the results. Deliberately creating that type of culture, I think, is one of the single biggest things that we can do to sort of promote four-star research. Um, it comes down to trust, trust and autonomy. Who would have thought? And funding. Impact a little bit more into our culture. So yes, it is uh -huh. it's something which does get looked at. I mean, sad and happy recently again. But maybe there is scope for further kind of embedding of impact and assessment of impact and thinking around that. So yeah, you're right. You see, the thing is, if impact is woven into outputs, right. then it's a win-win thing. You know, you have output and you have impact. So yeah. I have so many thoughts about impact. Um, in a subject like philosophy, it's uh, scary trying to get that 25%. But as I said, I'm very aware of the fact that there are some people who... Well, that's true. Maybe you are even worse placed than I am for, for this type of thing. But anyway, look, thank you, folks. I'm aware that we've run over time a little bit. I'm sorry about that, but I'm very grateful for everybody sticking with it. I'm aware that we have some sort of work in progress stuff to do. So I suggest that we bring this discussion to a, to a conclusion now. But this isn't the end of the conversation. Um, if you have questions about the REF stuff, which it would be useful to talk over again, please email me. You'll get your, my email address from the, the handout that will we'll circulate after this. I'm very happy to carry on helping out with colleagues here if that would be, if that would be useful. Um, but anyway, look, thank you, thank you very much for coming to this part of today's festivities. <laughs>